at Aging Webinars. A link to an online evaluation form will be provided at the end of the webinar and will also be sent to your email addresses after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants. The webinar will begin in 10 minutes. Please stand by. Please make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses to ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox. Please do not abbreviate, for example, yahoo.com into y.com. Please make sure that your details We are now using UP Manila Livestream and FB Live at Aging Webinars. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, Kindly refresh the page. For problems viewing through live stream, please refer to the guide at the bottom of the live stream. You may also watch through our Facebook Live at Aging Webinars. Participants should indicate his or her name in the comments box of FB Live as an attendance check. Reminders. The webinar lecture will run for 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or send personal messages to FB at Aging Webinars. A link to an online evaluation form will be provided at the end of the webinar and will also be sent to your email addresses after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants.
If you have not pre-registered yet, please register on-site at the registration link for today's webinar at the bottom of the live stream window or in the description box of FB Live. Registration is free. Please make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses to ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox. Please do not abbreviate. For example, yahoo.com into y.com. We are now using UP Manila Livestream and FB Live at Aging Webinars. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For problems viewing through Livestream, please refer to the guide at the bottom of the Livestream. You may also watch through our Facebook Live at Aging Webinars. Participants should indicate his or her name in the comments box of FB Live as an attendance check. Reminders. The webinar lecture will run for 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila live stream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or send personal messages to FB at Aging Webinars. A link to an online evaluation form will be provided at the end of the webinar and will also be sent to your email addresses after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants. The webinar The webinar will begin in five minutes. Please stand by. If you have not pre-registered yet, please register on-site at the registration link for today's webinar at the bottom of the live stream window or in the description box of FB Live. Registration is free. Please make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses to ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox. Please do not abbreviate. For example, yahoo.com into y.com. We are now using UP Manila Livestream and FB Live at Aging Webinars. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For problems viewing through Livestream, please refer to the guide at the bottom of the Livestream. You may also watch through our Facebook Live at Aging Webinars. Participants should indicate his or her name in the comments box of FB Live as an attendance check. Reminders. The webinar lecture will run for 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila live stream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or send personal messages to FB at Aging Webinars. 
a link to an online evaluation form will be provided at the end of the webinar and will also be sent to your email addresses after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants. The, web the webinar will begin in five Hello everybody and uh, good noon. Our time in Manila is exactly 12 noon and I am Dr. Ana York Bontok from the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority Batch of 1994. I'm speaking in behalf of the Aging and Longevity Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority. And we are holding um, a webinar series for this year to celebrate our 85th year as a sorority. So the webinar series will run every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and will deliver interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. Today's webinar will be awarded 10 PMA CME points for doctors and two CPD units for nurses. And our CPD units for physicians and pharmacists are still pending. So for today's webinar, we are privileged and it's a huge honor for me personally to have a distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine as our speaker. And she is um, Dr. Grace Ortesa. This Dr. Grace. She's a graduate of UP College of Medicine class of 1987. And she is the current chair of the Department of U Neurology of, and the, of the Institute of Neuro Neurological Sciences of the medical city. She's the head of Center for Memory, Language, and Thinking. That's MELT. Siguro nag melt down po yung memory mo, kaya ganon. And a member of the Dementia Council of the Philippine Neurological Association. She's also the president of the UPPGH faculty and alumni of neurosciences. So ladies and gentlemen, it's our honor and privilege. She's my colleague, my sis, she's also a uh, new sis from the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority Batch of 1987. It's our honor to have with us today, Dr. Grace Ortega. So, Dr. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going, uh, good noon, everyone, and I'm going to talk about a very broad topic. So, actually, it would be very difficult for me to limit this to only one and a half hours. One and a half hours, but joke yon. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss some topics that are just very close to my heart. Because as I said, very this close is, to your brain, doctor. <laughs> brain na lang. Brain na lang. Uh, brain na lang. this is such a broad topic. So we'll start with the basic question. And most of my patients are confused, no? and friends are also confused by dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes it is used interchangeably and sometimes they ask, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So anyway, uh, 
just to be so you know that we are on common grounds. Uh, this is a general term. When we say dementia, it's a general term that refers to a symptom complex. And it is uh, due to many things, due to many etiologies. Uh, however, the reason why it's used interchangeably or in, it confuses a lot of people because almost 50 to 80% of all dementias are due to Alzheimer's disease. And it is one that is most publicized in movies, teleseries, nanonood ka ba ng teleserye? The general story. Oh, uh, Adi ka ba doon? <laughs> okay. Okay, so, Angel of now, uh, we have to remember three important things. No? It's acquired, it is persistent, and it affects multiple spheres of mental activity. So, it means that you must have reached a certain level of normal uh, functioning and intellect and it distinguish dementia from mental retardation. And it is persistent, meaning it is not a delirium. It distinguish uh, dementia from delirium, which is uh, confusion at a certain period of time. And afterwards, you will return to normal cognitive functioning. And of course, it, distinguish it distinguishes it from, let's say, amnesia, uh, that wherein you are only, your problem is only memory or aphasia where your language is, own, uh, your problem is only language. So it involves several. Now, by the definition of itself, uh, I'm already going to tell you that dementia is not limited to senior citizens, okay, or elderly. Uh, even children can have dementia. But then it is more common and more debilitating in the elderly populations. So uh, sometimes we think uh, this is just a problem of uh, most uh, progressive countries or countries that are modern or rich because they have a lot of elderly in their uh, population. Well, uh, that is a myth because it is common and to top it all, dementia doesn't normally kill a person. So it's progressively debilitating and therefore very costly. So this is just a publication by the United Nations in 2017. And you will see here clearly that uh, from 1950 to 2050, we have a steady increase in the percentage of uh, population who are 65 and above, you know, the relatively uh, mature uh, portions of the population. Now, the opposite is true with the younger population, 0 to 19. Uh, in 1950, it's 44%, and by 2050, predicted to be 27%. Now, this is a publication by World Alzheimer's in 2015, and we belong, the Philippines belong to the low to medium income country. Therefore, it's the red graph there. And you would see that uh, the population of those who are 60 and above is also increasing. And by 2050, that will uh, comprise around 16% of our population. So now, why am I pointing this out? Because 10% of all individuals age 65 and older are affected by dementia, so 10%. And then by the time uh, we reach 85 and above, around 35% of us, you know, one third of the population are going to be affected by dementia. So necessarily when the population is aging, the number of patients afflicted by dementia increases. And this includes those with pure Alzheimer's disease with or without the contribution of stroke or cerebrovascular disease, which is also very common in this population. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common neurodegenerative disorder. 
And this is uh, based on WHO and IHME. You will see that dementia is among the 10, no? 10 leading contributors to disability adjusted life years burden among those who are 60 and above. So definitely it, uh, it is a big burden. Now, what is the current status? What are the targets of pharmacological interventions? More than 100 uh, pharmacological interventions are being tested and they target the supposed uh, pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease, what we know so far. And so, so far, this is the bad news. Uh, what we are able to achieve, and mind you, we have achieved a lot, is just to reduce the slope of the deterioration, meaning we delayed the milestones of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we, you are better, in other words, you are better than somebody who is not taking medications, but on a day-to-day -day experience, you are still deteriorating. But it is slower, slower compared to somebody who doesn't take medications. So this is the the status so far, and uh, this is based on a publication several years ago, and they found out that in fact the pathology in the brain occurs at least no a decade before the, the most subtle symptoms appear. So if you become forgetful, let's say at the age of 65, most probably the pathology or the disease in your brain starts when you are 55, okay? Or even at 50. So merong, merong ganun, ano? Uh, the changes already happen. And we call this uh, the preclinical uh, stage of Alzheimer's disease. It is that point or that period in time when you don't know that things are happening to your brain. So I will be focusing in the next, let's say, 20 minutes uh, on two uh, topics that are close to my brain. And these are the keys to lowering the burden of dementia. No, based on my opinion. So we can lower the burden of dementia if we do early detection and we do prevention. This should be our focus. So uh, I will be talking, no? this is a brief summary. Uh, we start with early detection. I will walk you through the steps and tools in the diagnosis of dementia some promising uh, procedures in neuroimaging, olfactory testing, gait testing, and biomarkers that will probably tell us when you already have pathologic changes in your brain, even before you become forgetful. And then uh, the second part would be dementia prevention. That's the question. Can you prevent this problem? Or is it something that uh, you just have to accept. No? But, Hirap naman yun, oh, so we will try to answer that. And if yes, we can prevent it, what strategies can we do? And I'll end with that. No? And how soon can we start? Now, I, before, before we start, I, can, uh, I would like to acknowledge the, some of the materials I'll be using will be coming from the Dementia Council of the Philippine Neurological Association. The Alzheimer's Disease Association of the Philippines, or ADA, my classmate, no, fellow UP College of Medicine, Batch 87, Dr. Frankie Fernandez, who is a neuroradiologist, Dr. Peter Harin, ENT, Dr. J.J. Chongson, a neurologist, and Dr. Robles, a neurocritical care specialist. Uh, they have uh, given me some inputs. Now, Let's start with the steps and tools in the diagnosis of dementia. So we, we follow certain uh, criteria that has been agreed upon or based on consensus by many experts. Now this one is from the NIAAA, 
uh, in America. So what are the diagnostic criteria? You have mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, and it begins with a concern either by the patient, uh, by the significant other, or even the doctor who is, uh, let's say, examining the patient, you notice that the patient is forgetful. So, but uh, the criteria is that you should be at least 1 to 1.5 standard deviations below the mean in terms of your cognitive domains and memory. So that will be very difficult to, to determine clinically. So you, ha you have to use some tools to make sure the, the cognitive functioning of the patient. They should be independent in function, meaning if, if you let them, uh, if you leave them in their house, uh, they can live independently with no problem. So they are functionally independent and they don't satisfy the criteria for dementia. And it has, you don't suspect any other reason why the patient has some uh, cognitive problems. Now, for all cause dementia, remember mild cognitive impairment, the patient is still functionally independent. When we say dementia, the difference is they are not anymore functionally independent, meaning. Uh, they cannot perform all the activities of daily living without assistance. So the that's the main difference. So it includes some other problems like problems in judgment, problems in uh, language, problems in visual spatial abilities, and also changes in personality and behavior. So but there are also some uh, presentations that are a bit atypical, but in Alzheimer's disease, the onset should be in insidious, not sudden. And we know that uh, as time goes on, like you compare the patient now versus the function last year, more or less there's a deterioration. So there is progression. Okay. So the core clinical uh, criteria for all cause dementia should be met and there could be evidence of uh, some problems like stroke, dementia with Lewy bodies. These are some other forms of dementia. So you could also have Alzheimer's disease having an atypical course or Alzheimer's disease mixed with vascular dementia and dementia of the Lewy body type or mixed with Parkinson's disease. So it makes the diagnostic process a little bit more complicated. But we have simplified that. This is the publication of uh, ADAP I was talking about earlier. So there's a step-by-step -step procedure, an algorithm which a healthcare practitioner could follow and it is, of course, in the book uh, published by ADAP. And this is an example of step one, wherein you ask yourself uh, whether this is really dementia, MCI, or this is part of normal aging. And we have a sample checklist like this one. I'm just going to show you portions of the tool because we cannot discuss this in entirety. Shadow so Mahaba. for example, memory impairment. Uh, example would be uh, they forget assignments, appointments, uh, they fail to remember recent transactions, and then you will have to compare it with, uh, with six months ago. Uh, you will have to say whether the onset is sudden or it, was it insidious, and then how often it is. So you're going to administer this interview to the, usually to the caregiver. And then this is behavioral NPI sample items. No? This is developed by Jeffrey Cummings. And this is an example. You ask the caregiver, are there delusions? And then there's an example. Does the patient believe that others are stealing from him or her or planning to harm here? Or, her or him. So you ask such questions and then uh, 
you determine the severity and the distress. And then there's the functional activities of daily living. Most of these, the reason why they, there are translations, it's the product of my obsessive compulsiveness. Translating all this material so they could be used uh, locally. So, so usually, if you are the administrator, you can use the English. If you think the patient doesn't really understand, you give the translation underneath. So this determines how much a patient needs assistance. And remember, this determines whether you have MCI or dementia. And then the second step is you compare the results of the mental status exam, your history, your PE and neuro exam, the assessment of functional status. You try to evaluate whether there are treatable causes of uh, the cognitive or behavioral impairment. And then you determine whether or not any of this is detected. So this is an example of a test commonly used for to determine whether the patient is cognitively <coughs> intact or not. It's called MOCA. Ano now, po yun? Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And this is already uh, MOCA Philippines, which Get was uh, translated and validated by Dr. Uh, Dominguez from St. Luke's. Okay, so uh, it's uh, the Filipino version. So you will see that the first part is an example of items for visual, spatial, and executive function. And then this is simply naming the lion, the owl, and the camel. And then you have, uh, they give five uh, words to test for memory. And then later on, there's a delayed recall and there are cues if it is not really remembered. And you could give multiple choices if uh, if you gave cues and they still don't remember. And then a test for attention wherein uh, you tell the patient, you tap your fingers every time I say letter A, and then the, the rest of the letters you don't, and then counting backwards by sevens. And then language, you say a phrase, it is repeated, uh, abstraction, and then orientation, like where are we, what's the date, so all of this, uh, you, you determine usually 20 main scoring. Uh, uh, main scoring the, the normal is uh, 27, okay? Below that, you expect something is wrong. Now, of course, uh, the older population take a lot of drugs. No? Sure, so issue, yeah. And many of them have depression so no? because they're socially isolated. So you have to do uh, a review of all the medications because like this uh, table I'm showing is an example of uh, the Beers criteria wherein you list all the medications commonly taken that could cause cognitive impairment. So you just remove the drug and the patient will go back again to normal. Of course, you screen for depression this uh, an example of one, it sums uh, anxiety and depression scale, and you simply ask yes or no questions. So really, for screening, if you detect uh, something positive, then you refer to a psychiatrist. This is an example of items uh, for anxiety. Like, do you feel nervous? <laughs> Kinakabahan ka na ba? Masyado okay. maraming camera. Uh Oo, -oh, maraming camera, maraming panong ata later. So if I can't answer, I will pass it on to you. So this is an example of the anxiety. And then uh, you look for other treatable causes of cognitive impairment like uh, uremia, hypo or hyperglycemia. You just simply correct the problem and then most probably the cognitive impairment will uh, resolve. Uh, the next step will be to put this all together and if it is a little bit iffy meaning no definite yes or no, you will have to refer to a specialist and then you make a conclusion whether or not it is, <coughs> excuse me, 
probable Alzheimer's disease, possible, or it could be dementia that is due to non-AD uh, causes. Now we go to the next part. Neuroimaging in the diagnosis of dementia. Now, why, why do we want to do structural neuroimaging? Of course, because sometimes your, the Alzheimer's disease has no cure at this point in time. No? As I said, we just give medications that will slow down the process. But there are treatable causes like chronic subdural hematoma. I have a lot of patients already who have uh, the symptoms of dementia, but actually uh, the uh, hematoma have formed in their brains and a simple uh, evacuation procedure uh, can uh, reverse the process, okay? Then we have normal pressure hydrocephalus and of course tumors, all of which might require surgery. We also want to determine whether there are vascular lesions or strokes. Uh, we could also use the neuroimaging to distinguish the different types of dementia. And it could also be used to monitor disease progression. So right now, uh, what is available uh, would be a dementia protocol, uh, which measures the, the following, you know, the GCA, you also look for cortical atrophy, MTA, which is atrophy that is uh, focused on the medial temporal lobe, and then CODAM score, which reflects parietal atrophy, and FASECAS, which uh, gives you the index of white matter lesions, and you also look for strategic infarcts. And this is an example, because MTA is one of the the scales that is uh, closely rela related to Alzheimer's disease. And you will notice that uh, it is uh, graded 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and there are corresponding MRI examples on the right. From MTA0, which is normal, you look at MTA4, where you have, you, sh you see a big, <coughs> area a mark widening of the carotid fissure and there is an enlargement of the temporal horn okay so uh, that this is visual <clears throat> now a score of less than 75 uh, uh, if you have a score of two or more and you are less than 75 this is considered abnormal <coughs> If you are more than 75 years old and you score three or more, this is abnormal. And uh, using the MTA, you have a lot, uh, you approximately have 85% sensitivity and specificity, specificity uh, especially for patients with AD. So this is good, okay? However, uh, a recent publication uh, have uh, looked into the ERICA score. Now, this is a 2018 publication. Now, what is ERICA? No? It, it looks at the entorhinal cortex. It measures the entorhinal cortex because it is the area in the brain that is first affected by Alzheimer's disease, even before you get changes in the hippocampus. So you can have uh, problems when you already have the clinical Alzheimer's disease or MCI in the entorhinal cortex. So this is an example of the score. Uh, you have normal. So the first one on your left upper quadrant is normal and compare that with the pronounced atrophy of the parahippocampal campus. Erica 3 on the right lower quadrant and the progression. So that this is also the reason why I said earlier, you can do monitor, monitoring. You just look at the changes in the para, in the entorhinal cortex. So 
Using this, there's 83% sensitivity, 98% specificity compared to the MTA, which I showed earlier, 81% sensitivity, but the specificity is only 67. So based on this publication, Erica using basically the same MRI, but measuring another, another part, part uh, is more, uh, is uh, better no, in terms of uh, test parameters. It is also correlated with existing CSF, cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. And it is also highly correlated with some neuropsychological tests. So we go to olfactory testing in the diagnosis of dementia. Uh, this is Brock staging that I'm showing, which I want to highlight here that the problem really starts, the pathology starts in the entorhinal cortex before it reaches the rest of the cortex. You have tangles and plaques already in the entorhinal cortex. So it's very close to the area of smell or olfaction. Now, this is the rationale why we think olfactory testing may be an early, olfactory problems may be an early sign, sign of Alzheimer's disease. So true enough, uh, there are studies, this one is published in 2016, which associated uh, olfactory dysfunction with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So they have uh, three and a half years follow up. They made use of 250 cases of MCI and they made uh, use of BC or brief smell identification test. So you may ask me, what Can is you this? So, uh, it, uses, it uses 12 odors and uh, it takes less than five minutes. So it's the, the test of choice on the mama delica. So uh, it, the advantage is that it incorporates multicultural items. So you, there's a cross-cultural version where the, the scents are banana, sarap ano, uh -huh. chocolate, cinnamon, uh, gasoline, lemon, onion, paint thinner, pineapple, rose, soap, smoke, and turpentine. So, ano, parang, ano na nga yung turpentine? Parang pang tanggal po ng ano, paint thinner din po yun. Thinner din yan. Thinner okay, din po yun. so these are the, the ones used for uh, the cultural version. Of course, you have version A and version B. Meron, ano, smell okay. of pizza. May ganon. Oh. Ano nakalagay po dito sa uh, version B? Sa version B. Okay. Pizza. So, the test retest re reliability is around 0.71. So, Matas po ba yun? Uh, okay na rin. No? Uh, the olfactory impairment, they found out in this study that olfactory impairment predicts MCI, those who have MCI who will progress to Alzheimer's disease and they they recommend that it could be used for screening for mci and people identify people who would most likely progress to alzheimer's disease so very promising now let's go to gait testing another one no? its role in the diagnosis of dementia so i am citing here some studies which show that Quantitative gait dysfunction is associated with risk of cognitive decline and dementia. So, tignan natin, paano ba lumakad? Ano? How do we walk? There's a problem, then we might consider uh, the possibility of these are early signs of dementia. So, we Ay, focus si on... Si na po, malayong malayo sa dementia. <laughs> we focus on, on three parameters like pace, rhythm and variability. Don't tell me you're going to to demonstrate. Hindi ho, pero I am um, kasi <laughs> baka ho, kung magaling kayo mag lava walk, malayo kayo sa dementia. <laughs> Ay, yung mga mga arte po, okay. advantage na yun. So, quantitative gait measures. I really want to know about this. Yeah, they Sige found mo. out that it could predict future risk 
predict future risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Predict future uh, risk. In initially non-demented older adults, meaning they are normal if they have gait problems in either pace, rhythm, and variability. It would predict future uh, cognitive problems. Validated na po ba ito? Yeah, uh, this, the next uh, study I am showing you is actually a uh, meta-analysis. Meta no? uh, they reviewed 5,211 papers and they were able to, what fit into their criteria are 26 out of this. And dementia was associated with the following. Slower pace, no? yung mabagal maglakad. Oh Impaired God. rhythm, para yung cadence and then increase variability in, in the way we walk. Uh, but they found out, you know, there's, uh, they found out that Alzheimer's disease patients are less impaired in, in terms of pace, rhythm, and variability compared to non-Alzheimer's non disease type of problems. So the results demonstrate that gait could be a clinical marker and it could also discriminate between oh the dementia subtypes. <clears throat> now let's move on to biomarkers in the diagnosis of dementia. Maybe you have read no, that there are uh, tests coming out that is based on uh, blood tests that could actually determine whether or not you have dementia. But what are biomarkers? In fact, structural MRI is a biomarker. A biomarker is a characteristic that can be objectively measured. So it indicates normal biological or pathogenic processes or pharmacological responses to a therapeutic intervention. Hindi, alam ko dito mo, like there's a test for Huntington's. Na nun, uh, yeah, oh, ganun. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. So like... Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, you have a stage where the neurons are injured and there are byproducts. So, so if you may detect this, the yes, it's a biomarker. The MRI I showed earlier, because the entorhinal cortex has fungus and plaques, it atrophies, and then you're going to measure it. It's also a biomarker. Okay? So this is a hypothetical model which shows you the different biomarkers and the different stages. So from normal, the first to change is uh, synaptic dysfunction, which is detectable by FDG PET MRI. And the last to change is clinical function. So as I mentioned earlier, by the time you, you detect somebody who is already... Uh, so many changes has happened and this may be the explanation why most of the treatments cannot change the, the course of the disease. Na po. You start it very late into the like illness. 10 years after. Okay. So this is again a uh, uh, graph showing you the 10, uh, at least a decade between the deposition of alpha, beta and the clinical syndrome of AD. There are already deposits before you're able to show that there is dementia. So really, we have a preclinical stage. So, and how do you identify it, them? You can identify them by using the biomarkers. The biomarkers. So that's how significant, that's the significance of this. Now, the last publication of uh, the NIAAA they have already incorpor or incorporated biomarkers in the diagnosis of dementia, especially the, these types of dementia or cases were in atypical, the presentation are, are atypical and the results of the test are really uh, not inconclusive. Ano po so, yung pinaka-common na biomarker? Uh, Ay, later na lang. Sige, later. Yeah, okay. mo na. Pero ayan ang question number one. So, kasi baka mga maraming gusto magpa-biomarker like mamaya. This is the the very important part no, of our talk right now. Can dementia be prevented? Mamaya na natin sasagutin. 
Mamaya. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Kasi alam ko meron ho magpapakamatay because they were told that they're gonna have dementia. Because I, 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 I told you there are many stages of dementia. There's even a preclinical stage. What is really true primary prevention when you know that it starts 10 to 20 years before clinical symptoms? True primary prevention is really to prevent the start of the pathophysiological process. So it could only be done if you have biomarkers. Okay? Then, um, if a pre- yeah, is a stop of yung mga plaques before, uh, even before uh-huh. the clinical phase uh, starts. So I again show you the <coughs> hypothetical model and the biomarkers. And the earliest is amyloid beta accumulation. So if you could detect that, theoretically, you could start the treatment at that point. That would be primary prevention. True primary prevention. Wala pa kung tayo nun. Well, it depends on the development of the of the biomarkers. Sige po. So right now, uh, we go to primary prevention, uh, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. So if you superimpose that to the graph I showed earlier, you delay the onset of pathology in primary prevention. In secondary prevention, you delay the onset of clinical signs or cognitive impairment. Tertiary prevention and treatment is when you already have the clinical signs, but you try to prevent its progression. Uh, right now, the treatment that we have is focus on tertiary prevention oh, and treatment. Okay. So the idea is to move towards the left of the graph. So the Lancet Commission have published a very interesting article. And uh, this is a very nice graph. Uh, we will try to enlarge it so that you will see the bottom line. It shows you that 35% of risk factors in Alzheimer's disease are actually preventable. But 65% are potentially non-modifiable. So the answer to the question, is it modifiable, preventable? I say yes, 35% of the time. So what are the modifiable risk factors in dementia? So I now use our publication, uh, 2017, Philippine Neurological Association Dementia Council. Uh, These are supposedly the protective and the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And I will just cite some aspects like psychosocial. High education is protective, so protected na tayo. Yun lang. Okay? Extensive social network. We're doing this, this lecture, so we have cognitive activity, di ba? Oh. But in terms of diet, um, do we have protective factors like diet, folate, vitamin B12, antioxidants? The, the risk factors are, some of them are genetic and vascular like hypertension, dyslipidemia, if you smoke, if you have a heart disease, okay? So this, all of these were investigated, okay? And I will show you some of the results of our review. Traumatic brain injury, very strong evidence. Repeated injury to the head. Midlife hypertension, midlife obesity, smoking, diabetes, we have strong to moderate evidence. History of depression, sleep disturbances, and hyperlipidemia, still with unclear evidence but potentially there years of formal education very strong evidence physical exercise strong to moderate mediterranean diet and cognitive training uh, moderate evidence alcohol consumption lower evidence and social engagement still uncertain maybe because of methodological problems now just some definitions when we say paf we refer to population attributable from fraction. And we mean, <clears throat> what do we mean by this? What will be reduced in terms of percentage in new cases 
over a given time if you eliminate the risk factor completely. Okay? So these are the results. Early in life, if you have, if you eliminate less education, your PAF is around 7.5. In midlife hypertension, 2%. And take note, hearing loss decreases the PAF by 9% in midlife. In later life, smoking, 5.5%, depression, and so on. So uh, it decreases the risk of uh, developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, let's see the first part, APO EE4, so that is genetic. You cannot change that, but education, it lowers the risk by 8%. In midlife, hearing loss, if you are able to manage that, 9%. Hypertension and obesity, additional 2 and 1%. In late life, if you stop smoking, 5%. If you, if you address depression, additional 4% reduction of risk. If you stop physical inactivity, 3%. If you don't isolate yourself, 2%. If you manage diabetes, additional 1%. Okay? So 35% well. now. Okay. So now let's go to strategies. So we therefore recommend, based on this, no? that uh, active treatment of hypertension in middle age and older people without dementia so that you reduce dementia incidence. You intervene no? in other risk factors like more childhood education, exercise, social engagement, decreased smoking, managing loss, depression, diabetes, and obesity and delay it will delay or prevent one third of the cases. So very high na. So we have increased brain cognitive reserve. Uh, ito yung mechanisms of these preventive strategies. You increase the brain reserve, you reduce brain damage, and you reduce brain inflammation. So this is the explanation why these preventive strategies work. Okay? So Based on the recommendation of NIA, we also know that cognitive training, blood pressure management, based on RCT, uh, uh, management of hypertension and obesity and other risk factors, uh, those that target cardiovascular risk factors are also working. Remember that in a healthy body and heart, resides a healthy brain okay so that's a nice uh, bottle cry and then we have they make a have a healthy lifestyle appropriate dietary intake moderate physical activity and participation in cognitive and social activities are recommended throughout life uh, we should also have environmental safety and personal protection so that we avoid traumatic brain injury. And we involve the national government and the creation and implementation of a roadmap for maintenance of brain health. So we now have that mental health. Uh, yeah. So for the recommendations, physical activity should increase your heart rate uh, from to 120 per minute for 150 minutes within a week, coupled with a healthy diet. Engage in lifelong learning. So those of you who are listening to this, you are engaged in lifelong learning. Keep the brain active with cognitively stimulating leisure activities. Isip na tayo ng pakasyon. Maintain a wide social circle of friends and relatives. Have friends, love them. In early recognition and management of depression, is also recommended. So thank you for listening. Hi, thank you, Dr. Uh -huh. so, um, wow, we have a signage here. Let's read it. <laughs> we have 556 participants registered for this webinar. 
and 95 of them are viewing through the UP Manila live stream and another 104 through Facebook Live. We have viewers from the USA, Sweden, France, Qatar, Japan, Belgium, and Abu Dhabi. Wow. So thanks for joining us from this far away places. Hello. <laughs> wow, sikat na tayo dito. <laughs> so, um, maganda tong, ano, actually, I was really quite interested. No, shock. Hindi, <laughs> actually, maganda po ito. So, while we're waiting for the questions, how can they ask questions? They can type it through the webinar. Can they send questions through Facebook Live? Are you monitoring? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can also send um, questions through Facebook Live. And Doctora will be very glad to answer them. And I'll be very glad to read your questions. So I was really parang also parang overwhelmed also by the, all the information. And then terrorized again <laughs> by all the information. <clears throat> so I was, for example, um, ito lang ha, assuming you had you took care of, kasi I'm sorry, nagkakaedad na rin ako. Assuming you took care of parents who, were Al who had Alzheimer's, What's your risk? And what should you do? Well, it's a, yeah, it's a, uh -oh. actually, and I think it's a very practical question for everyone. A combination of uh, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Assuming because, yung tatay mo na Alzheimer's. Uh, ano that, what, what's your action ngayon? Yeah. You're 45 years old, maybe you're 30 years old. What do you do? And then you heard na, one to uh, no 10 percent by 65 and 35 percent by 85. So nasa 30 ka pa lang, and then hopefully you still have this 10 year gap. Yes. So ano, ano dapat mong gawin Middle ngayon? age. Oh, ka ba? You belong to the middle age. I belong to the millennial generation. <laughs> Early. No, no, no. Uh, I, I will answer your question. Oh, you took care ano? of a father. Yeah. yeah. Also uh -oh. Let's disease. see yung tatay niyo po na. Yeah, the risk, the non-modifiable risk factor is there because I am assuming that. Uh, Partially, uh, your your risk increases four times if you have one close member of your oh family who is affected. And if you have two members of your family affected, like there's one in your mother's side and one in your father's side, okay. your risk uh, is multiplied by uh, around 40 times. 40 compared times for both the, parents or both yeah, close relatives. Yeah, compared, compared to the... To the population, to the normal, to the unaffected. So you see, na binyo po ten percent uh, of sixty-five uh, years old population. So, so your risk is forty higher, and there's also a, a pattern that usually, if you are genetically inclined, you will manifest the symptoms earlier. Oh yeah, I was so, gonna ask that then more. So uh -oh. the the high risk patients, the the advice here, high risk population. Yeah, how would you say that you'd be high risk really, 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 uh -oh. really early detection? Maybe they're the ones who would be who would uh, have to undergo a baseline uh, cognitive testing, even without symptoms. You do the baseline. So uh, if you're highly functioning then we know if there's a decline because you could still be passing all the tests, but it's only because you were so highly so, functioning. Oh. So if we have your baseline, we will immediately know when you are uh, deteriorating or declining. So it will be good to have a baseline, even if you don't have the symptoms yet. And of course, uh, it will be you are the best candidate for undergoing biomarker testing. Now, po, oh, oh, now, oh. now. Let's say you're let's clarify oh. that because ano you have to know? undergo uh let's say in the long parents with Alzheimer's, then punta na sa doctor. What will wh what's the workup for uh, you, ma? There's a genetic testing which determines whether you have the APO E E4. Usually it's the Ano po yun? The, the gene that ah, that's is, a gene Opo, uh, Apo EE4. that is uh, associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So there's also a uh, ano blood test po yun? No, uh, yes, a blood uh -oh. test. So pa blood test na po kayo. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. And then, then? Uh, there are uh, MRI. Uh, so pa MRI na mentioned uh -oh. earlier. Uh, we're in. We do the 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 test for 
the entorhinal cortex I mentioned earlier, it's called a recap. Uh, you can do that, or you could do a longitudinal uh, volumetry, meaning you have a baseline again, just like the memory and cognitive testing. You have a baseline. You repeat it periodically, uh, yearly, or every six months to determine whether there is some Declining change now. so that you could start the treatment earlier. Okay, so that's that's what should be done. Yeah, if you had if to, you, oh, if you had to parents, your, you no. feel that your height is, get a blood and, test, and have an MRI. As I said, you have two risk factors. One is probably genetic. The okay. other one would be probably psychosocial because uh, they found out that those who give care to patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease are also at high risk of uh, so caregivers of Alzheimer's problem. patients. Because of, not because it is contagious, okay. but because of the stress. Nakaka-stress. Oh, stress, stress naman ho. Uh, so that's the answer to your question. So if you had, if you, <laughs> if you had a parent with Alzheimer's po, would you suggest going to the doctor already? Oh, pa-test na kayo? Pa-test, yes. Opo. And um, if you, ako, I'm an internist, eh. But it, I always ask people if they had hypertension, diabetes, ganun po. Alam ko lahat yung tanong na yun. But I never thought who to ask directly if anybody had Alzheimer's. And if they tell me that two parents, let's say ako naman ho yung doktor, ano naman na dapat mong gawin next? Kasi ho, I don't have like, in my clinic, I don't have an Alzheimer's test po eh. And I don't know if a lot of internists could, do that. You could refer them to oh, me. No, that's oh, no. naman, ma'am. <laughs> Siyempre, alam ko na yung address no, sa medical no, clinic, masusugod no, no, na kami doon. Uh, what I'm saying oh, is, uh, but for a regular uh, internist po. Usually, there are, of course, memory centers uh -oh. all over the Philippines. Uh, specialized centers that really focus on dementia. Because as I said, the far advanced dementia, you don't really need to do eh, okay, a lot yeah. of testing oh, oh. because Kasi obvious, just obvious by yeah. clinical, oh, oh. just by talking to the patient, you would know. The challenge is really on the very early stages At of yung, dementia. The challenge who is for internists also oh. to be able to know what to do. Kasi po, if I ask yeah. you that, if I, before this lecture, if I, you told me that two parents had Alzheimer's, I would just say, I'm sorry to hear that. Pero kailangan mo may action pala doon. And that action is to refer them to a memory center. And in the past, when they have, they, they're they usually undiagnosed. So you have to say, uh, were they malilimutin? Were they ulyanin in their old age? Because usually, oh, you know, they will just assume yeah. oh, that it's, na, it's part, part of normal of aging. Normal aging. Oh, naging malilimutin, but because matanda na, something like that. So when you simply ask, do you have any relatives with uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease? They will say no because the thinking is that it's part of the normal age. When you're old, you're expected to be Ulyan. Mom, so ano? It's a myth. Opo, nabanggit, it has to be correct. Hindi tama yun. Uh -huh. Mom, ang question lang, kasi po, tinanong nyo that you translated it. How do we translate po dementia into, what, what is the clinical term po in, in, in Filipino? Kasi ho, parang ang feeling ko yung malilimutin doesn't even begin to cover the problem. No, uh, nag-uulian yan. Nag-uulian yan po is a term. That's the closest uh, translation. Na, oh. nag, nag Kasi po yung ulianin sa Pilipino, ang meaning po na naka, parang hindi po siya ano eh. Oh. Hindi siya sakit. Parang ano po yun eh. So, uh, uh, maybe we could... Th there is no strong term. Oh. Kasi when I hear dementia, I get alarm. When I hear po ulianin, parang naisip ko po matanda But na. it's up to us. Because, oh, kasi because po yung alarm level, like for example, when I hear cancer, Filipino or English, nakakatakot po. People already po say, uh, we, we use... Ulianin okay. as dementia. So yun, yun na po yun. And we say, uh, malilimutin as somebody who is forgetful. And if it is really more or less regular, uh, we could say, maybe you're starting, nagsisimula ka na maging ulianin. Okay. And uh, we should consider it as a disease, not a normal part of aging. Ah, okay. Because we know that there are people who are 
97, 100. Na malinaw. malinaw. Opo. So, I, that's my usual answer. If they say, eh, matanda na eh. So, I'm, malilimutin na talaga. Kahit naman ako, or ikaw, or, or even young people could forget. But it takes a certain regularity for you to be able to say that it's really a memory problem. So, we could reserve the term ulyanin to somebody who's really with disease, like dementia. And, uh, malilimutin or naglilimot-limot na as past probably forgetfulness. We don't know. It's a neutral term. We don't know if it's really dementia or just uh, oh, okay. some other reason to be forgetful like not paying attention, okay. multitasking, okay. depression. Okay. Kasi yung culture-based din po yan eh. That's why. Mm-hmm. Ako po, when I hear the word dementia and Alzheimer's, parang bilang doktor, napapanik na ako. Pero when I hear the word ulianin, saka po makakalimutin, parang hindi po nagsistrike yung... Parang it doesn't strike fear in my heart, but me- medyo dapat siguro. Ayun na nga. So, let's go to a few of the questions po. Good afternoon po. Good afternoon din po. I am Mr. John Far- Francis Parawan. Thank you, John Francis, for giving your name. From Mariano Marcos Memorial Hospital. In Ilocos Norte po ito, no? Hello, John. And, John? Oo, oh, John Francis po. He is a trained geriatric and gerontology nurse. So, ang tanong po niya is, in assessing patients if they have dementia or Alzheimer's, they usually use the mini mental state However, it wasn't mentioned po. Uso po ba rin yun? Is it still accepted as a training for screening? Uh, many studies have shown uh, the limitations of MMSE as a tool. The reason is because uh, it is uh, so many items uh, are language items. So if you have problem in language, it necessarily abnormally lowers your score. Uh-huh. Now I'm talking as a psychometrician. Oh no, ako I, I, I am a graduate. Whoa, hello. Yeah, and I established uh, for the board exam for of psych. Of course, uh, okay. I love, I'm proud to be a psychologist. Psych sock ba kayo na? Psych sock. Ah, oh, okay. psych sock din ako. Ah, uh, UP Diliman. Oh, 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 oh same man. No, no. So we're really psychologists. So that's the reason I really love this uh, area of application. And I know that there are several uh, UP Diliman psychologists and LaSalle psychologists who are watching right now because they're interested in the topic. So, ano na ulit yung question? <laughs> Ang tanong, puso pa din ba? Okay na. Puso pa din ba yung mini mental state? Oh, oh. Uh, yes. Uh, as I was saying, it unnecessarily puts a lot of uh, items that are language based. So if you have a language problem, your score Parang becomes very low. Pero actually, low. hindi naman kayo masyadong yeah. Alzheimer's. Now, pa. all over the the world, I think, the 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 screening test of choice now is the MOCA. The MOCA, po, yun ang cognitive uh, assessment because of the different cognitive facets that it covers. So. Uh, I've shown earlier, you, you almost see an equal distribution of the different cognitive domains. So, so better should, switch to the more ano po. Yes, and uh, we, we are uh, currently doing a study that translates it to eight major uh, languages of the Philippines like Uh-oh. and validating it. All right. So, so it, no problem. It's so available to to online. Ah uh, yes, you can Uh-oh. you can download the Moka Filipino. Meron online, online ma'am. Okay. Iba ho yun sa Moka Uso. Teka, tanong ko lang. <laughs> this question is from Grace Pamintu and Serrano. Thank you. Is amyloid beta measurable by blood too and not just CSF? And ma- ma'am, ano, kasi mabuti nga binanggit itong CSF kasi hindi nyo po in-elaborate yung CSF findings. Yeah. So is that part of the workup na ngayon mo? If someone's makakalimutin, eh, eh, usually, eh, as final talk nyo na kagad. Usually, we don't uh, really talk about the biomarkers so much because Right now, mostly the the application is in research. Right Aha, now, okay. Opo. Right now, unless you encounter a patient with very uh, the 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 diagnosis is really 
problematic and it's really important for you to make a diagnosis. Remember that uh, the knowledge of having to uh, okay, the prior knowledge of uh, that you will soon have Alzheimer's disease is still an ethical issue oh, and it's still being deliberated whether it is mentally healthy to tell you that you are going to have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the, the, there's also a problem of in terms of insurance. There are some issues. Po issues. Yeah. So right now, the use of biomarkers is really limited to research and high-risk populations and problematic cases. Add to the fact that the bio biomarkers right now, I mean CSF-based and blood-based, are still relatively expensive. Well, one is in okay. the market. Para ng I, I don't want to mention the okay. one is in the market. The, the test the is yung. around ten thousand. Uh, it's a blood test. Okay. Ano naman yung specificity mo? Uh, sabi ko nga, Let's say you are the two parent person uh, with who's an accountant, and you heard that there's a ten thousand test. How so mugo do yung mga tao do? And and ano specific ba siya? But, but the, let's say you you took a test. What should you expect? It, it only says that you have it, but you are not sure whether you're going to manifest clinically. So it should go uh, hand in hand with all the other test diagnostic. So it shouldn't be taken without proper consultation. Yes, as I said, oh. this needs a lot of review Kapatia from the says, different so. stakeholders. So do you believe in commercial memory enhancers? Like yung mga tinitinda po? No. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm sorry. No? Talagang hindi? Because, uh, Kasi syempre linalaklak po yun ang mga tao. These are, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, studies uh -huh. because we reviewed these studies and we found out that there is currently no evidence as to their efficacy. So, so wala. Far, we cannot wala. endorse any of them. Uh, no, none. Um, even medicine, uh, supplements for for prevention. Wala. Other than the ones that I mentioned, because they're the ones, the strategies are based on RCTs, the randomized controlled trials. Okay. So you have items there that have. One study positive result, one study negative. Wala pa we cancel ah, out. So yeah. we cannot make such Wala pa What how about repeated anesthesia due no, to general uh, surgery? Wala po. That's that's also uh, one of the myths. No. How about when, when, you, you, when, nyo, tapos when, when you interview a patient, mo. usually what they remember is from the time I underwent usually yung mga na CS anesthesia. Now cesarean is spinal. Eh, yun nga kung sinasabi ng mga tao mo eh. Pag so, the so, anesthesia okay. is spinal. So, wala rin po yun. I really can't. Kasi a lot of moms naman, baka naman naguluhan lang sa buhay nila. But yung yeah. GA po na, wala pang study about GA. Unless it, unless you have, the you underwent uh, complication during Oo, the procedure. Pero yung straight GA po, wala. By itself, no. Opo. What practical advice can you give caregivers of loved ones with dementia? Oh my gosh. Caregiving by itself is not the stress is the one that increases so the dapat risk. Mo so you should learn oh, to okay. accept that you cannot do it by yourself. No? You have to get the help of people and then you have to do rotation. You should have time out. Oh, you man. should learn how Mga to self care din ho. Yes. Uh, because some daughters or sons Take it upon themselves. You know? They they want to be the one to take care directly of the parent. But that's not healthy. You know what? So dapat po may ano rin, balancing yeah. your life. And then okay. you can join some uh, lay organizations. Uh, they help each other. Um, what brain exercises can we do? Okay. Uh, Yung iba po to, it's ang ginagawang exercise. I, I have a separate... Uh, okay, meron! I had a separate lecture on oh, that. That was, I think, Dr. Henwino also was the one with me. Oh, uh, the four pillars of of brain health. I think that's the title. But actually, 
what it says, it says is, uh, you have to challenge yourself. One is relaxation. Uh -huh. So, you should learn how to relax, find time to relax. The second one is to engage in new things. Meaning, uh, like, nagko-crossword puzzle ako, I do crossword puzzle. You do it paulit-ulit and you already know that. Uh -oh. uh, Baguhin naman. It doesn't take uh -oh. uh, a, a lot of your brain cells anymore, no? So, what you should do is to challenge yourself to take on something new like using a smartphone <laughs> or using the the computer doing facebook or ayun na oh, kinuldukan okay. niyo na nga so, yun so na tanong ko yung facebook ba na yourself because you notice some of our uh, senior citizens would okay. say ay matanda na ako i cannot learn that okay. definitely it is they can learn that no we know that and the other one is increase the level of difficulty. So I said something new to challenge yourself and then once you're engaged in it, you increase the level of difficulty or complexity every week. So let's say now I can I can uh, comment Facebook, next week I will post. And then the third oh, so, week something... you will troll wag naman. Uh -oh. no, no, I said but <laughs> Now the the, so, the the fourth one is uh -huh. uh, multi modality. Uh -huh. So imagine if you are a member of a book reading club because I have a lot uh -huh. of uh -huh. uh, fr friends who would tell me what's your hobby? Read book. You don't even know if you're still reading it or just staring at it. So I I discourage <laughs> that. Uh -huh. You read the book. The following morning, you go walking with your book club friends uh -oh. and you discuss the chapter uh -oh. that you read. Okay. So you are physically you are physically exercising, you're critically analyzing what you read. Uh, so if you are making use of different aspects of your brain, uh, even the positron emission tomography, it's uh, uh -oh it shows that the entire brain lighten, lightens up. So for instance, I want to listen to music. Only one part of your brain will be activated. But you try to create music. Sing along, tap your fingers, dance around. More parts of your brain will be stimulated. So multimodality. Ma'am, ano opinion niyo sa Facebooking to prevent ano, Alzheimer's? At yung mga taong, like my employee, for example, mom, I'm preventing Alzheimer's during work hours. Paano po? Like, or, or like, what's your opinion po on social media? Opo. It's, it's, it has, just like anything else, when abused, it has its bad points. But by itself, it's very healthy because there's social engagement. You can just sometimes stay at home, no? Uh, sometimes you could have interaction by using the live. You you can talk to each other. So know? basically, it's how you use the social yeah, media. Yeah, you code. can you can move. It's really how you're going to use it, no? But if you're basically a negatively inclined uh -oh. person, you will find something negative in everything. Or that you do. Di ba? Like, you tell somebody, you exercise. Ah, laging umuulan eh. Yung ako oh. mag malamig. Naalikabukan ako mga ganun. Basta everything, just because they don't want to exercise. Everything you say, negative. So, there's so a problem there. So, it depends on how there. you use the social media. So, oh, oh, oh. social media and any other form of mentally stimulating activity. Could even good, even so. relax relaxation like yung mga iba majong no they play majong with their friends you have to oh, oh, yung ano mo. Oh, so oh, sabi nga nila that's uh, so quite there, there are many uh, activities what is, is just yun. staying at home sitting in your couch looking at the television no. you don't have anybody to talk with Ila. so that is really you have all the ingredients to being to having dementia from Ace Cruise, how about microwaves po? 
Anong microwave? Siguro ko yung pagluluto sa microwave. And then, may tanong dito. Is frequent use of microwaves contributing to the increased risk of dementia? That's the complete um, question. I, I honestly, I don't know. Wala naman, no data. I really don't know how to answer that, but personally, I avoid using the microwave. Hindi ko kayo nagma-microwave. Now, I don't know. Bakit po? Well, usually because... May data ba, ma'am? Wala. Oh, okay. uh, wala, wala, data. If you were very strict about it, like uh, scientific, no, RCTs, no data. Except that uh, if you can avoid it, because the rule in, uh, for example, yung diet in Alzheimer's disease oh, oh, and dementia, oh, oh, oh. Diba there are supplements uh -huh. like uh, calcium, you get in the pill, uh -huh. vitamin E, you get in the pill, vitamin D. The finding of many studies is it's best when you get it from natural sources. Oh, no, now, if I can cook on a stove top or I can have it fresh, why do I have to use the the microwave? So I wouldn't lose anything by avoiding ah, okay. it. But uh, that's, pero wala that's, naman hong naka oh, oh, but that's so just po. me. So, so get okay, yeah. uh, uh -huh. So I, as I said, I really It's don't a personal know. choice lang ho. Pero how, wala how you could publish. relate? Uh, wala pa ako. I haven't encountered anything okay. like that. Relating the use of microwave with the incidence of wala Alzheimer's ako. disease. Yeah. Pag-ilig lang ko kayo sa fresh foods, ma'am. That's good. No, no, okay. no. Uh, maybe tabletop and oven toaster uh -oh. and oven, uh -oh. di ba? Okay, or, no. or the usual uling, di ba? Why, why not? It's more exciting. Oh, wala naman. <laughs> Eh kasi ho, ano eh, mabilis. <laughs> oh, yun. Is there any remedy or prophylactic <clears throat> medication or treatment to avoid if most of the family elderly had Alzheimer's or dementia? And this question is from Teng. Uh, uh, you remember the, oh, tsaka yung, ano, the, the graph I showed you? May, may medication dun eh. Yeah. The very nice graph I showed you, it's still 65% non-modifiable. And most of that is based on genetics. genetics. But if you increase your cognitive reserve, Pwede ba meaning uh -oh. uh, you engage in lifelong learning, you you study for a long time, you, you you stimulate your brain, you avoid cardiovascular problems like hypertension, diabetes, then you're able to delay this and they 35% yeah. naman you, um, hindi naman it's not 100% penetration that when you have the gene you're going to have it hindi, it's not 100% uh so you can stop smoking uh have a healthy lifestyle yeah. uh that's the way and once detected uh, even without clinical manifestations yet, you can start treatment So that's what you so can do. Healthy lifestyle, wala akong gamot na marerecommend. Hindi. Uh, you can start with the medication. Take note, I talk about preclinical. Uh, uh, opo, opo. So you can start treatment. Uh, nga, when, you when should you start to treat? Opo. Well, the, the indication for the medications is still at the clinical when you are already eh, but huwag tayo maghihintay eh, kasi may 10 years na uh, doon eh. alam mo naman we practice evidence based ah, okay. wala pang evidence sa 10 years no? uh, when, when there's already uh -oh. some evidence that it could it can help pre, um, pre, no, delay uh -oh. so ito yung uh, tinatawag yung tertiary prevention no that is the true primary a true primary uh, oh, oh. But that is based on all the the biomarkers. If you're able to detect a na a preclinical patient, usually we don't detect that. Who will go to a doctor when you still don't have symptoms? Hey mom, if you had two parents, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So and, that's that's the oh, point oh. over here. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. So the probability that you'll get a patient at the preclinical stage is very rare. So, so wala masyadong experience. No? Uh, wala masyadong data and evidence. So it's very difficult to say. So wala pang ano, for the preclinical. No? And 
question po dito, the diagnostic test available in the country, o oo naman na sagot niyo po. Which one? Um, ang kalahatan na po yung tanong niya, are di these diagnostic tests available in the country? Uh, most, most of the ones that I mentioned are available except the ones that are still, uh, I mentioned they are promising. Uh, in terms of uh, blood-based tests, I know there is only one okay. available, available right now. There might be some coming. Uh, we are not so sure no, about that. But the MRI, the structural MRI, they're available. Oh, may MRI naman. Uh, we have uh, centers which cater to dementia in different uh, tertiary hospitals. So you, you could just ask around. So, yun. Because Info. we... Meron. Wala pa rin masyadong nakakatalo sa ano eh, specificity and sensitivity of the, the algorithm I showed you earlier. Uh, it's still around 85 to 90 plus percent uh, specificity and sensitivity. Um, last, last question. Mm -hmm. Kasi po, in the screening of elderly patients, you mentioned po that there's a list of medications po that could be possibly causing dementia and that you might stop one or two of them and that the person would be. What is the most notorious po? Na talaga, if you were an internist, you'd tell me na, Anna, watch out for this gamot. Can you name like mga two, ma'am, na talagang sa tingin nyo, notorious na po siya sa mga matatanda na dapat itigil? Um, Itigil? No, for example po, ano, uh, how about ano po, uh, sleep medications or stuff like that? Yeah. Yes, definitely. A lot of them, um, they they take sleeping pills. Oo, okay. nakaka-ano ho ba yan ng dementia? No, not dementia. Could just lead to... Uh, parang delirium, ma'am. Par parang gano'n reversible. It is drug-induced. Oh, parang drug-induced. Uh, oh. So you think sleeping pills would be one of the things that you should investigate as, yeah. a, as a clinician? Mom? Yes. Na definitely. definitely. Uh, oh. Prolonged use. Oh, oh, yung matagal na po. Oh. So, some of them just regularly take oh, parang, every ano, night. Parang vitamins na po uh, nila yun. And uh, you'd be surprised how they, they manage to get prescriptions. Well, they could ask their friends. Yeah, they they have no. So you yeah, really have to uh, to investigate. Oh, oh. Some antibiotics. They. they ano hong uh, ano? Uh, will you want us to look at that? Kahit kahit wala like, like, maybe so. one or two lang na parang. Pero ako in my practice, mm. sleeping pills were something that I would watch out for. Or you may iba na po yung ano nila from too much sleeping pills. So sige, I think that's it. Okay. So thanks, thanks so much, Doctora. Nakigrabing dami kung nalaman. And para para nang stop talking time dalawa. Hindi maganda mo yung topic. And I guess that's what happens when two psychologists meet. So thank you, Doctor Ortesa, for that super interesting talk. We and um, tapos na po tayo sa questions. So I guess it, this is our final na po. So in summary, we learned from Doctor Ortesa's webinar that dementia is common. And number two, that we should watch out and screen for it. And number three, I think healthy lifestyle is the key. So again, the Music Mafia Sorority would like to thank our esteemed speaker, Dr. Ortesa, for taking time out from her busy schedule to be with us today. For those who are worried and want to be screened, she can be located at the Medical City. We also thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Music Mafia Foundation. We are grateful to, for the support coming from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, the UP Manila Information Management Service, and the DOS, the ASDI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. Most of all, we'd like to thank your participants for spending your lunch hour with us. So thanks very much. To receive your certificate of attendance, do answer the evaluation form within two days to receive your certificate of attendance, which we will email to your registered email address. And so please, our next webinar is from February 8, 2019, 12 noon, for the webinar on dry eye, ocular diseases in the elderly by Dr. Oh, wow, this is Dr. Mingita Padilla. So we'd like to invite everyone to attend the UP Med webinars every Wednesday, now given by class 1994. And together with Dr. Grace Ortesa, we're closing this webinar 
see you again soon and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. One more.